and we waited and we started volume resuscitation. So these patients may require volume resuscitation, but please remember that volume loading uh, is important in right ventricular failure, but you have to be very cautious because uh, sometimes you can overextend the right ventricle. Then vasopressors like norepinephrine, dobutamine can be used. And finally, if the patient has got a right heart failure, ECMO or extracorporeal support can be utilized in units where it is available. So this is important points, uh, but uh, by the time the patient is uh, uh, going up to a higher level of support, the prognosis is very poor. So we have to focus on the reperfusion treatment, which means how you are going to reperfuse your patient. So thrombolytic treatment is available and uh, there is reduction in mortality and uh, recurrence of pulmonary embolism is reduced. There is a chance of bleeding and uh, uh, it may be unsuccessful also and uh, increased risk of bleeding is there in uh, patients who are intermediate risk. So therapy is not without any risk, but please remember the life of the patient is very important. And after explaining the uh, risk and after ruling out the contraindications of thrombolytic therapy, you can initiate thrombolytic therapy in these patients. So in our patient, you can see the patient has a CT scan and uh, we started, uh, uh, this was an intermediate probability, hypotension was not there. So since the expertise was available and the CT scan showed bilateral uh, major pulmonary artery embolism, so catheter-directed thrombolysis was uh, given an injection LT place, which is the component tissue plasminogen extractor, it was given. So, if we look at the catheter directed thrombolysis, uh, and uh, uh, please remember that uh, the thrombolytic therapy intravenous is recommended only for patients who have a hemodynamic deterioration. And uh, in our patient, there was no hemodynamic compromise. and uh, you can offer these patients a rescue thrombolytic therapy or percutaneous uh, catheter directed treatment if you have availability of uh, these uh, therapies in your clinic. And uh, we thrombolyze the patient, uh, and you can see a repeat echo was done. The pulmonary artery pressure was 50. Initially, you remember it was 85, so it has reduced, and that means the thrombus load is less. And after 24 hours of thrombolysis, we started the LMWH. So this is the recommendation. Once you have thrombolyzed the patient and for 24 hours, there is no bleeding. The patient is uh, not uh, have, having any other risk factors for initiation of LMWH. You can initiate LMWH after 24 hours. So 36 hours of post thrombolysis, uh, this patient started complaining of headache and nausea. And uh, his responses were not good. PCS was also, has also gone down. It was seven. We did the coagulation profile, which was normal. And the patient continued to deteriorate. The sensorium went down and the saturation also plummeted. So the patient was intubated. We examined the patient again, and the pupils were bilateral, bilateral mid-dilated and not reacting to light. So definitely he suffered an intracranial hemorrhage. And as I told you, uh, one of the complications, less than 1.7% of the patient can develop a intracerebral bleed. And in this patient, there was an acute SDH. So an exoparent was stopped and we started uh, penitoin to reverse the effect, we transfused the uh, fresh frozen plasma in two units of PRBC. And this patient had to undergo an emergency craniotomy and decompression with placement of a cranial drain. So after two days uh, of craniotomy, this patient was extubated. You can see the blood is uh, gone and the uh, patient has started to improve. So if you look at the side effects of thrombolytic therapy, Intracranial hemorrhage is a known complication and it can happen. So now what to do? Once your patient has got bleeding after thrombolysis, how do you manage the patient 
because the patient can develop a pulmonary embolism in the future also. And intracranial bleed is a contraindication to give any further thrombolysis. So in these kind of patients, uh, IVC filter is indicated. And in this patient, an IVC filter was placed. And the, these are the indications for IVC filters. And uh, it can be used in patients who have uh, absolute contraindications to intercoagulation and uh, should be considered in cases of PE recurrence despite oral anticoagulation. So we have put the IVC filter and the patient is on NOAX, 150 milligram BD. Repeat echo was done, which was okay. And then we had advised the patient for IVC filter removal after three months. And that was done. And uh, all these uh, anti-cardiolipin, anti-phospholipid, all the prothrombotic screen was negative. So anticoagulation uh, guidelines are there. And uh, usually anticoagulation is recommended for three months. And uh, it is recommended for more than three months if you have recurrent VTE and uh, There's the first PE without risk factors. And uh, if you have to uh, use NOAX, uh, then you can use a reduced dose of NOAX after six months. So these are the recommendations for indefinite anticoagulation. Usually we use it for three months. So this patient was followed and was readmitted after five months. After five months of uh, the initial episode and the filter removal, the patient developed breathlessness, right leg swelling, SpO2 was this, d dimer was high, and the Doppler showed a DVT. So again, this patient developed a DVT, we did a CT, and there was a filling defect. That's to a pulmonary embolism. So since the patient was stable, we started the patient on IV unfractionated heparin, and then started the patient on uh, warfarin after day three and then this patient was started on SMA control and by maintaining the INR because the patient was on NOX so the NOX had clearly failed so we didn't want to continue NOX now so we changed to a acidocomerol so this patient was again admitted and uh, we have to remove the IVC filter because you know it has to be removed you cannot keep it because it blocks and can block the IVC. So, so what to do after uh, the patient comes uh, uh, post recovery after three months, then one of the known entities is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. These patients can continue to have pulmonary hypertension, which is dyspnea and uh, manifest mainly as a progressive dyspnea. So this is uh, very important that you evaluate them for pulmonary hypertension. And uh, if you have a persistently high antiprobian P dyspnea, then you can look at this uh, patient and do a VQ scan. A VQ scan is important in these kind of patients where you can we suspect uh, pulmonary hypertension, chronic pulmonary hypertension, uh, post uh, thrombus, and uh, where you see mismatched perfusion defects. And then you can continue to manage them. and. Uh, Patient was started on Riosigoat. I will not go into these details because it's a bit complex. And then the patient is starting doing well. So this is my uh, end of my presentation. Thank you.